What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the headquarters. Welcome back to BDGE Fantasy Football. My name is Nicholas, and we are talking about a very important topic today. That is running backs for fantasy football. It's important because they're basically the only fucking important position in fantasy football. If you got good running backs, if you've got two of the guys that we're going to talk about in today's video, one, you cheated, two, you're set up for a championship. We're talking about my running back rankings for the 2020 fantasy football season. This is not dynasty. This is redraft just for 2020. I know we've done a lot of dynasty content. If you're interested in joining a dynasty league or you're trying to start one up with your friends, yesterday's video will be perfect. Noah and Mike on Bunk Bed Breakdowns broke down. They broke it down on Bunk Bed Breakdowns exactly how to start a dynasty league with your friends. The best settings, the best platforms, the best rules, and everything involved. So go check that out yesterday. Today, redraft fantasy football 2020 my top running back rankings now i'm only going to do the top six today one through six and i know a lot of you guys are gonna be like what the fuck how are you gonna do a 30 minute video with only six people y'all know i like to break it down with the big facts we get in depth if i were to do the top 12 you'd be sitting here for two hours which some of you guys might actually like but listen it's nice out it's going to be one of the only nice days for the next two weeks in new york so i'm trying to catch some raises you can see your boys getting a little caramel color going over here i've been tanning non-stop the last couple days i'm just trying to get outside because we've been cooped up for the last 200 and fucking 42 days it feels like right now so top six running back rankings for 2020 fantasy football tuck your shirt in stop yelling and let's eat if you're watching me on youtube that's beautiful for me, not for you, obviously. But if you're listening via, via the podcast, I got nothing but love and respect for you. I want to take some time, just read a quick review that someone left for me, as I will be doing weekly in these videos. So thank you if you are a podcast listener, a five star rating review would be. Thank you from Sky Rick P. He says, the most entertaining, accurate, and research fantasy analysis you will find. About to go big time out of the dungeon into the big city. Goddamn right. Shouldn't change these guys. You better tuck your shirt and stop yelling before you click play. My man's got it correct. So thank you, Sky Rick P, for that. Again, iTunes, it's BDGE, Fantasy Football, on all the podcasting platforms. Let's talk about running backs. We're going to jump into my top six as well as where they're currently getting drafted. All the ADP data that I bring up will be courtesy of FFPC. FFPC are high-stakes fantasy football leagues, people. I'm not making this shit up. These are the people that are paying $350, $750, $1,200 that are fucking psychos to play in these leagues, but this is where the actual information is coming from, so you're not finding shit that's more accurate than what we have to date running back one huge shocker here i want people to be prepared for what i'm about to say okay so please don't hit the thumbs down button when i when i reveal the first name on this list and you guys are like what the fuck it's uh it's actually christian mccaffrey carolina panthers running back the 101 the running back one they didn't do anything in the draft they didn't do anything via free agency obviously nothing's going to change with christian mccaffrey's role i don't care how many reports of matt rule coming in and any coaching staff in the history of christian mccaffrey talking about they're going to lighten his workload they're not going to do that he's the only running back there they just resigned him to a literally record-breaking running back contract they are going to do nothing but continue to feed him and feed him and feed him was the contract the bad contract uh the whole running backs don't matter thing the way i would put it into perspective is this the value of the running back position is not uh at its peak we'll put it that way when a running back does really well let, let's compare the positions right obviously the quarterback is the most valuable position when a running back goes out such as christian mccaffrey who just had a historic year by all measures and his team goes 5-11, and 11. that should probably tell you something of the impact that a running back has on its team's win-loss record. If you go out and have the best running back season of all time, I know it wasn't literally the best, but one of the top running back seasons of all time, and your team can't win more than five games, there's not much more to say. If a quarterback goes out and has a historic year, you think the, the, the years that Brady and Manning and these guys are throwing for 50 fucking touchdowns, their team is going to play poorly no that is the value of the position that is where this whole running back matters value thing comes from it's about winning on the field does christian mccaffrey's 2000 yards make dubs no 
Regardless, it's going to make dubs for your fantasy team. They have checked down Teddy, Teddy Bridgewater coming under center. Joe Brady is the new offensive coordinator who orchestrated one of the most potent college offenses of all time last year at LSU. For those of you that don't know, Joe Brady's like this 31-year-old mad genius. He was the offensive coordinator last year for the LSU Tigers, who won the national championship, who had Joe Burrow, who had Jamar Chase, who had Justin Jefferson, who had Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, who had Thaddeus Moth, who had Stevens Hudson. Just a fucking plethora of offensive weapons, and we're going to soon find out that Joe Brady was a monster part of that because Christian McCaffrey is about to have another monster monster year Carolina defense is going to be god awful they lost like half of their team meaning they are going to this is like the last few years in the NFC South has just been a shit show between the Falcons the Carolina Panthers and the Buccaneers of just letting up 72 points and then having to score 72 points and this is going to happen again with the Carolina Panthers this year so they're going to need to throw and then they're going to need to throw and then they're going to need to throw and D-Max the guy who's going to catch a lot of those passes he's going to catch another 100 plus passes this year 94 percent snap rate will it come down I mean probably right Right. Zeke was the next highest running back last year in terms of snap rate for his respective team, and he was a full 10% fewer snaps than C-Mac was. C-Mac played on 94% of the snaps last year. Zeke was at around 84. So it tells you the gap between where they were. I mean, don't be an idiot. Don't get cute here. It's Christian McCaffrey. Vegas has Christian McCaffrey penciled in as a 2,100 yard over under once again, and a 15 and a half touchdown over under for the season. Let's just move on to running back two, Saquon Barkley. He is currently the second running back off the board. He is currently the second pick overall per FFPC data. 13 games played last year, half of them probably with a high ankle sprain. He finishes with nearly 1,450 yards from scrimmage and eight total touchdowns. The high ankle sprain for both he and someone else who we'll talk about in a minute will be the theme of, of the analysis for Saquon Barkley this summer. You look at his game log. Game one, 139 yards from scrimmage. Game two, 125 yards from scrimmage and a touchdown game three he suffers the high ankle sprain he returns in week seven from that high ankle sprain and the next five weeks are brutal after averaging 6.4 yards per carry through the first three weeks before getting hurt that dips down to 3.2 yards per carry over the next five games after he returns his evaded tackles per attempt you know Saquon's one of the most elusive backs in the NFL he goes down from top six running backs in terms of elusiveness down to 22nd overall during that span. Barkley's high ankle sprain happened in week three. If you fast forward to the end of the year, right? The last three weeks of the season for Saquon, monstrous for him. Total yards per game, almost 180 yards from game. His yards per carry go right back up to 6.2. His elusive rating is right back up there to top eight running backs in the league. His touches per game, 24.7 touchdowns. The guy scores five touchdowns in three games. So was it Saquon? high ankle sprain that limited him last year obviously he's one of the best running back prospects one of the best NFL running backs we have ever seen come into the league of course it was a high ankle sprain that limited him this year don't be nervous about taking him in 2020 here is what I will say there there I, I do have some devil's advocate here because there will be people that are looking to draft Saquon Barkley over C-Mac at that 101 position and I think Maybe some people were a little bit disappointed from the receiving output that we saw from Saquon Barkley last year, who finished the season with 73 targets, 52 receptions in 13 games. If you pace that out to 16 games, you're looking at 90 targets, 64 receptions, which is a big drop off from the 121 targets and 91 receptions he had in his rookie year. What's the big common denominator or what's the change of denominator here going from the rookie season to the sophomore seasons for Saquon? What could possibly account for the lack of targets? I think it's the fact that we have a mobile quarterback under center for the New York Giants now. That dip in receiving production from running backs is going to happen when you have a mobile quarterback. You just have to use common sense here, guys. When a mobile quarterback is under center, they've been one of the most athletic players on the field their entire life. Their first instinct is not to look at another read and pass it off. Their first instinct is to run, right? You're getting pressure from the outside or whatever. You want to take that shit right up the middle. You're getting pressured from the inside. You want to bounce it outside. You're not looking to dink and dunk. You're not looking to pass the ball. There are way more rush attempts for these quarterbacks like a Daniel Jones than there are four dump offs to Saquon Barkley. Daniel Jones averaged nearly four rushing attempts per game last year. And that's almost certainly going to mean, you know, one or two fewer targets per game for a guy like Saquon Barkley. It's just the facts. I don't think it's reasonable. I don't think it's responsible. It'd be irresponsible of y'all to project Saquon Barkley's receiving totals to be where Christian McCaffrey's are. Because again, you know, even if you think Saquon Barkley is a more talented pass catcher than C-Mac, I'm not here to argue that. The problem with him losing those one or two targets per game to Daniel Jones' rushing, that's the difference between 
80 targets and 110 targets on the season, right? And when you have a player like Barkley, if you're getting an extra 25 targets on the year, he'll take one or two of those to the house, right? And that's an extra 120 receiving yards. That's an extra touchdown or two that he's not going to be having. Every touch counts. And that's also another reason why I'm a little bit sour on a guy like Austin Eckler if we have Tyrod Taylor as a starting quarterback for the Chargers, but we'll touch on him probably in the next video. So we'll do the first six running backs today. We'll do the next six running backs probably on Tuesday or Thursday of next week. That being said, though, obviously Saquon Barkley has one of the highest floors in the NFL as a fantasy football running back as long as he stays healthy. I think like a 90 and 65 reception season through the air is usually like top five or top three receiving numbers among fantasy football running backs. So he is fine. So while the C-Mac type receiving ceiling is definitely lower than I think people are realizing, the floor is is more than enough to be the RB2 this year in fantasy. Right now, you look at Saquon in Vegas. They got him penciled in at 1750 for total rushing and receiving yards combined and 11 and a half total rushing and receiving touchdown so 17 50 and 12 you're feeling pretty goddamn good about Saquon Barkley this year when it gets to running back three this is where we will have a lot of debates Cook is it Kamara is it Zeke some of y'all might get real fucking annoying and pick Derrick Henry we're not gonna go that far I, I have I have succumbed to the fat running backs all right I will draft some of them this year reluctantly but they ain't making the top three I'll be honest I wrote this blog maybe two weeks ago and I think I have changed my tune on who my RB3 is and it's going to be Ezekiel Elliott man right now he is the third running back off the board in FFPC drafts he is the third player overall off the board I'll start off by playing devil's advocate with Zeke because I talked about him a lot in one of the videos prior to this I'm a little bit nervous about Zeke honestly that I this is more of like an outside of the box thinking that I don't think a lot of people are going to cover I don't tend to look at Zeke as someone who stays in the best shape, right? He's never like the most ripped running back despite wearing those like fucking things. And you're just like, Zeke, you, you shouldn't be wearing those things. Not having mandatory training camp and not having like conditioning with the team. I'm a little bit nervous about how Zeke's going to come into the year, man. Like you already see him. He was getting scolded for having the, the, the party or whatever with Dak and mad people at the house. So he doesn't really give a fuck what's going on during the offseason. I know it was probably only like 10 people, but still, right? It shows you the mindset of what Zeke is thinking and like how seriously he's taking this shit and whether or not he's putting like football first. When you have all these other guys who are probably just competing to get into tip top shape, he's out here obviously not doing that. He's kind of doing the bare minimum, I would assume, for a guy like Ezekiel Elliott. So I would be a little nervous just for the fact that they are not going to be together though he did have you know the semi holdout and came into the, the to the league fine last year so just something I kind of had to ha uh, wrap my head around I think one of the biggest changes this year will be the coaching staff there right we have Mike McCarthy coming in as the head coach Mike McCarthy in his last few years in Green Bay with Aaron Rodgers they passed the ball at a significantly higher rate than most other NFL teams and significantly higher than the Dallas Cowboys have been accustomed to the last few years. If you look at 2018, they passed the ball at a higher rate than anybody in the NFL. 2017, top seven. 2016, they were number uh, two overall. When they got to the red zone, when they got inside the 10 zone, they were still throwing it at a extremely high rate. It gets you a little bit nervous because then you look at the leading ball carrier for the time under McCarthy in Green Bay. You'd have to go back to 2008 to find a 300 carry running back under Mike McCarthy. It was Ryan Grant at 312 carries. Now, Zeke had the 10-game season in, in 2017 because of the suspension where he only had 240 carries, but that's 24 a game, well over 300 if you pace it out to 16. But in his normal three seasons, he's gone over 300 carries. It's kind of like a rock meets a hard place. What's going to happen here? Or is McCarthy going to have a 300 carry guy? Is Zeke going to lose that streak of having 300 carries it I would I would very 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 much assume that Zeke goes far over 300 carries the issue I have with Zeke or what makes me a little bit nervous about Zeke is what happens to his target numbers right the reason I put him back up to three is because his floor is just so incredibly safe he is now operating as the featured back as the full workhorse back in an offense that's going to be absolutely dynamite I know they did lose Travis Frederick which will be a blow to their offensive line but I think the pieces on that offensive line still make that O-line a, a very, very good offensive line, still an above average offensive line. And now with the weapons around them, man, Michael Gallup going into his third year, Amari Cooper signing the fat contract, Dak Prescott coming into his own, C.D. Lamb, the God. Blake Jarwin, I don't know if he's an upgrade over Jason Witten, but he'll definitely stretch the seam a little bit more than Jason Witten did, opening up a lot of the area by the front line. Zeke, it's just like, it, there's no way teams can stack the box because their wide receiver group of those three guys is arguably probably the best in the NFL by far. I don't actually think it's close. So what happens to Zeke in the passing game though with all those weapons there? So I think like he's the, the, the lead operator in an offense that should be like top five in the NFL, which probably means his touchdown upside is really, really, really high. During McCarthy's 13-year stint as the head coach, 
there were only three 50 target seasons for running backs. Now, Zeke had 72 and 95 targets over the last two seasons. And then looking at the last three years, here are the running back target shares on Green Bay. 2018, 17%. 2017, 18%, 2016, 17%. Those are all bottom 24 in the NFL or worse. So does Mike McCarthy offenses throw to the running back? We saw as soon as he got out of there, Aaron Jones started getting a ton of targets and Jamal Williams started getting involved in the passing game. So I think you just take him at three and don't look back because his floor is incredibly high. And of course he has a he has the ceiling of scoring 15 or 16 rushing touchdowns because this offense is going to be so good. In a full PPR league, I probably actually would pivot to a Kamara or a Dalvin Cook because their involvement in their passing offense is probably probably much much higher especially if a, from a floor play I think Cook has like a 65 catch floor Kamara has that 80 catch floor basically because he does it every single year but I don't know how involved he gets in the passing game but his rushing upside is incredibly 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 high Zeke's touchdown and rushing yardage total whatever from Vegas right now he has their total yard set at 1734 so just underneath Saquon Barkley his touchdown total is a touchdown higher than Saquon so they have him at 12 and a half so I, it wouldn't surprise me if he goes and he ends up going for like 1500 on the ground 12 rushing scores and then another 200 through the air and you know one or two receiving scores so that's probably what you can expect from Zeke he's a guy who's been extremely durable he doesn't deal with injuries he's been able to handle the workload you know as opposed to Kamara and Dalvin Cook who have dealt with injuries throughout their career a little bit so Zeke at the 103 maybe not the highest ceiling but definitely the safest floor play here I have Dalvin Cook listed right after Zeke as the fourth running back off the board he's also the 104 overall in drafts right now and the running back four off the board we don't realize just how good Dalvin Cook was on a points per game basis last year and I know that is the issue if you want to fade Cook in the top five because of the injury concerns I have absolutely no issue with that I myself tend to play way more risk averse in the early rounds so taking Cook does become a little bit of a risk but I think they extend Cook I think they give him some money and I think they show that he's one of the key pieces to that offense for the next you know three or four years he's still he's still young hasn't played the full 16 games of course but he did get in the 14 last year and in those 14 games he was the RB2 in points per game behind only C-Mac. He left week 13 with an injury. Until that point, he had never seen fewer than 60% of the snaps for the Vikings in a game, averaging 71.2% of the snaps. The shoulder gets hurt, and then from those weeks on, he plays in 44, 47, and 43% of the team snaps. Obviously, he was limited by the shoulder. It's important not to forget how fucking good this guy was, though, from weeks 1 to 11. In 11 games, in 11 games, he scored over 25 half PPR fantasy points in 5 of 11 games. He went over 22 half PPR fantasy points in 7 of 11 games. He actually led C-Mac in points per snap from the running back position and through 11 weeks. Obviously, playing on 72% of the snaps compared to C-Mac's 94% of the snaps is going to be the difference in why C-Mac had more fantasy points, but the elite efficiency numbers cannot be overstated for or understated, overstated, understated. I don't fucking know. Y'all get the point. Cook is a beast when he's on the field. Kevin Stefanski is gone, but Gary Kubiak kind of steps into that full-time OC role, and we would expect exactly the same that we saw last year in Minnesota. Their O-line was, you know, one of the laughing stocks of the league for a very, very long time, but they stepped up in a big way last year. They ranked seventh in run blocking per football outsiders, top 12 per pro football focus. So they've got a legit front five up there to block for Dalvin Cook. They got Rudolph coming back again, so he will be blocking. They got a lot of two tight end sets, which means extra blockers on the line all the time for your man's Dalvin Cook. And there's just not much not to like here, right? The running backs in Minnesota last year had the single most receiving yards coming off of RB screens in the entire NFL, which is a staple of this offense. Lots of runs, lots of play action, lots of screens. Pray for good health and Cook will take you to the promised land, baby. If you don't like Cook because of the injury concern, again, I completely understand that. And you'd probably feel fade him for Alvin Kamara, who is my running back five. He's currently the running back five in FFPC. However, he is the 106 going behind Michael Thomas. So similar to that of Saquon, as I mentioned, uh, Kamara's 2019 season, the analysis that you'll probably get from everyone is has to do with the high ankle sprain weeks one through five Kamara leads all NFL running backs in evaded tackles per attempt the single most elusive running back in the NFL and it wasn't even close he suffers a high ankle sprain those next six seven eight weeks his elusiveness rating dips to running back 40 so you talk about vintage Kamara the single most elusive running back in the NFL statistically speaking high ankle sprain drops to number 40 so again like Saquon was it the high ankle sprain? Of course it was a high ankle sprain. During the few final weeks of the season when Kamara was scoring at will and breaking big plays, something we didn't see all year, he gets rolling again and we see vintage Kamara, what we can expect in 2020. The touchdowns were definitely a little bit funky this year, right? Kamara scores 31 touchdowns through 
the first two seasons, which was 31 games. So he's averaging literally one touchdown per game. Last year, he scores just six in 14 games. Am I worried? I'm not. And here's why. People are going to point to like Latavius Murray being there or something. But Kamara still led the team in goal line carries. He had seven of them. Latavius Murray only had three. It's not like they gave that role away, even with Kamara missing some time and being off the field. Like he was still the primary goal line back. He also had seven targets inside the 10 yard line. Latavius Murray had zero. Michael Thomas had just two more than Kamara did. When you're talking about the running back of consequence within the 10-yard line for passing, the goal line back, it's still very much Kamara's work. I guess it was just a funky year for the offense in terms of the number of opportunities that the team just had there altogether, which I think you could just kind of chalk up as an unlucky or lucky thing based on the fact that Kamara still very much has that role, took the high percentage of the opportunities down there. So when you look at Kamara again, we'll pull up some Vegas numbers. They got him penciled in as 1550 for total yards, rushing plus receiving. They got him in as 10 and a half touchdowns rushing and receiving you could see the juice is on the under so they do expect him to finish at about 10 but 15 50 10 touchdowns 80 receptions that seems about right for Alvin Kamara this team has not really changed anything on that offense they do bring in Emmanuel Sanders but I don't think that really changes much considering they've just never had a wide receiver two there so this offense will still very much funnel through Michael Thomas funnel through Alvin Kamara funnel through a little bit of Emmanuel Sanders maybe some Jared Cook but fundamentally it's not like they're changing coaches or offensive schemes or anything like that so vintage Kamara the guy who was the most elusive running back in the NFL from weeks one through five last year is what we probably can expect Alvin Kamara animal go get your man so we won't make fun of you I promise running back six I'm curious what you guys think of when you're getting down your rankings here. This is a half PPR list, by the way. Sorry, I probably should have prefaced with that. It's not standard. This is not full PPR. It's the best of both worlds, which is what your league should be playing. We get to running back six. It took me a minute to get the calculations flowing, get the blood flowing to the brain and figure out who I wanted to pick as my RB6. But after about 13 seconds, it, it, it became pretty clear. I am curious, though, who do you guys have as your running back six? But before I announce who my running back six is, I want you all to just scroll down to the comment section. It takes you five seconds. Those top five guys are off the board. Scroll down, type in a comment. Who is your running back six? I'll give you six seconds. All right. All right. All right. All right. It is. Uh, it's I just got to own the loss. I just got to own the L. It's King Henry King. I will acknowledge him as as King. Running back six, Derrick Henry is currently the RB6 in FFPC drafts, which is interesting because FFPC drafts are actually full PPR. He is the 107 off the board. So he is the sixth running back, only behind Michael Thomas, that is not a running back. This one's pretty cut and dry, to be honest. I mean, it's at the end of the day, you're just getting a very, very good fantasy asset a very very good running back you, you look at Derrick Henry you're immediately like he needs to get more involved in the passing game then it's like does he also look at the running backs behind him that you want to rank above Derrick Henry that you think will be more involved in the passing game they all have questions there you look at Joe Mixon you look at Nick Chubb you look at Josh Jacobs yes they're all capable and they're all fine but none of them actually get the work in the passing game so Derrick Henry yes gets even less work and fewer targets than those guys do but all of them have receiving questions so just give me the best runner give me the one who's going to get the most carries going to get all the goal line work going to have his offense run primarily through you so give me the king i've taken my l and i've knelt at his throne i feel like a fucking game of thrones character having to walk through town and everyone's yelling shame shame sh fucking shame at me and you guys are the shame people you fuck. i don't even remember who cersei was was bowing to at that point but that's me and i'm bowing to king henry all right so we know what they want to do it's run the ball and then they're going to 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 run the ball and they're going to run the ball all right, might be a stretch. A fucking counter stretch because they're going to continue running the ball with Derrick Henry. Okay, I'm done, for real. I don't believe this is Henry's last year with Tennessee. I will also put that on the record. But if you do, even better. That means they're going to run the motherfucker straight into the ground, straight into a coffin, one of those nice golden Egyptian coffins that you see in the movies and the mummies where they got fucking booby traps everywhere. This is booby trap King Henry season running back six. Let's look at some Vegas numbers. They don't have his touchdown totals up there, but they have his total yardage at 15 10. He is the rushing yardage title holder. Mm, yep, I'm just not good with this software yet. Henry going to go for a lot of uh, rushing yards this year. Why do you keep fucking sending me Bill Spectrum? I close out your... So if you're not on the Henry train, if you're not ready to be part of royalty, I don't know what to tell you. I'm in. I've knelt to the king and it's over. So those are my top six running backs. We got C-Mac, we got Saquon, we got Zeke, we got Dalvin Cook, we got Kamara, and we got Derek Henry. 
I would say that the first, I would say C Max in his own tier, Saquon's in his own tier, and then the three, four, five are probably in a tier amongst themselves as the top six. Next video will be number seven through 12, which will probably dive in a lot deeper because those guys really need to be differentiated. If you enjoyed the video, thumbs up is all I ask for. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We'll be doing tons of fantasy football content throughout the summer. If you are on iTunes, uh, rating and review would be the best thing I've ever seen in my entire life. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Y'all can go check out the draft guide. The Rookie Dynasty Guide is live, bigdogsdraftguide.com. We will have the season-long guide available in July. So if you're just here for redraft purposes, that's when that comes out. But you can get it on pre-order pricing right now, bigdogsdraftguide.com. Or if you're eligible in states that play DraftKings, FanDuel, Monkey Knife Fight, Monkey Knife Fight has sponsored the draft guide. So you can literally get both the Dynasty and Rookie Guide and the season-long guide for 10 freaking dollars. No more cursing on the channel. 10 freaking dollars you go go over to bigdogsdraftguide.com slash mkf you deposit ten dollars using the promo code bdge you get both of those motherfuckers for shit you get shit again you get both of those for ten dollars plus twenty dollars to play with that monkey knife fight bigdogsdraftguide.com slash mkf i love y'all i'll see you next video